Hey there, I'm Nick Owens. Welcome to Hindsight History. Today, I'm sitting down with historian Roger McGrath, U.S. Marine, former UCLA history professor, author of Gunfighters, Highwaymen, and Vigilantes, as well as the recent column, That Damn Cowboy, tale of Theodore Roosevelt's adventures out west. Pretty heavy introduction for you. Not bad. You're a wel welterweight champion as well, I'm told. I don't know about that. But, uh... <laughs> and I'm really excited to sit down with you. You don't know much about me, but I am a lifelong presidential history buff, fascinated with American presidents. Theodore Roosevelt eluded me for some time, and I read Edmund Morris's works on him, and I was introduced to him. So I'm curious. What drew you to Theodore Roosevelt? You know, what really grabbed you about TR in this particular column? Well, the fact of his years in the West. I mean, we have America associated with the cowboy. Well, one reason for that is Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, he was a cowpuncher in the West. He had two ranches in the Badlands of Dakota Territory. Um, and this, this helped uh, legitimize uh, the, the cowboy as a representative of America. I mean, they, we had cowboys back in the colonial days. They were boys who took care of the cattle somewhere outside of the settled areas because that's where there was grazing lands. And it was not some highly respected uh, symbol of America at the time. It was something mm -hmm. the kids did. Uh, maybe in Europe, they went out and protected the uh, sheep from wolves or something. But here in America, the cattle, and you had cowboys mm -hmm. looking after the cattle. But now we have the American West, Trans-Mississippi West, develop. And the cowboy mounted changes the image. Because any time in history you have a mounted warrior or anybody else mounted, then they become a bit aristocratic. The, the equestrian now, this is a romantic image. And so out west, we had our own version, maybe of those romantic uh, knights of, of old in Europe uh, jousting on their uh, horses. Well, now we have the cowboy in the American West. And Roosevelt became a cowboy in the American West, except he owned the ranch. Uh, one of the things that brought me back to him uh, was in the introduction of your article, talking about on the Upper West Side in New York City, uh, right by the Natural uh, Museum of Science, uh, the statue. And, you know, I remember looking at the base of the statue, and I'm going to, uh, you know, quote this. It says, author, statesman, scholar, humanitarian, historian, patriot, ranchman, conservationist, explorer, naturalist, scientist, and soldier. I remember having the thought, that can't all be possible. He could not have done all of those things, and he did. Could we have another president like that to, uh, today? Well, it, it, it's seemingly impossible. I mean, after all, Roosevelt not only received the Nobel uh, Prize for Peace, but also the Medal of Honor, as well as he was author of two dozen books. I, I mean, all these diverse accomplishments in wildly uh, divergent fields uh, from, from military heroism to exploring the Amazon uh, to, to writing books on a number of subjects in American history, including what is still the standard work for uh, the Naval War of 1812. That was the title mm -hmm. of his book. It's still a classic. Um, so I don't know if you could have that wide variety of experiences and accomplishments, too. I mean, uh, he just didn't participate in peace negotiations for the Russo-Japanese War, but he received the Nobel Prize for his efforts. Uh, he just didn't participate in uh, the War of 1898 he received the Medal of Honor for leading the charge up at San Juan Heights, uh, Kettle Hill in particular, but we call it the charge up San Juan Hill, the Medal of Honor. Uh, now, how could you possibly do all those kinds of things in more recent times? It seems 
improbable at least. Right. And just to be moving so fast and to pack all of that in in six decades, as well as being president of the United States, is no tall task. Pretty remarkable. Well, the age at which he accomplished these things is also amazing. Remember, to this day, he remains our youngest president. At 42 years old, he became president of the United States. But that was after a long career. Uh, he held many offices. Uh, he was the uh, police commissioner for New York. Uh, he was the assistant secretary of the Navy. He was the, the governor of New York. Uh, and then then president of the United and vice president, and then president of the United States. Um, all of this at that young of age is extraordinary. What's incredible about him, the impression you know I have when when I read about him is I sense today you might refer to him as manic or a bit <laughs> uh, you know some today probably somebody would maybe try to medicate this this man. <laughs> And is that is that fair? There seems to be that rush uh, to action at times that that feels uh, a bit tense with with his energy. What what do you think it would be like to be in a room with with Theodore Roosevelt? Well, he he was driven and highly energetic uh, and incredibly enthusiastic. Uh, anything he undertook, he gave it one hundred percent. His heart was in it. His mind was in it, and. Uh, I guess if you weren't of that nature, it would be exhausting <laughs> to be to be around them. But on the other hand, be inspiring. Um, this is a man. He, he was devoted to America. He was an absolute uh, patriot in in the truest uh, sense of the word. Um, his, his father at one time told him that uh, when he went off to Harvard, he said, well, first, your virtue is the most important thing, your morals, your mm -hmm. virtue. He said, and then your physical well-being, and only third, your studies. Um, and that's what we approached everything. I mean, there, there were moral issues involved in all of this. Uh, people don't realize also he was a devout Christian. I was part of the Dutch Reformed Church in America, uh, and he was, he was a, in regular attendance. And uh, the Bible was the first book he took with him on all his adventures, wherever he went. Um, and, and so that was part of his makeup as well. And he had that kind of, uh, I think, a certain amount of uh, zealotry that was inspired by his religious faith. Would you enjoy a conversation uh, with Theodore Roosevelt as a conversationalist? Would that be? I, I, I would love it. It would be one of those things. Could you go back in history, have a conversation with Theodore Roosevelt, have a conversation with Thomas Edison, have a conversation with Henry Ford, with, uh, uh, I mean, he, he is a figure that uh, because of his, his robust intellectual kind of prowess almost um you you would just love to sit down with him and have an hour with theodore roosevelt i know today it's it's fashionable to to psychoanalyze hard not to in the world we live in but we learn so much about uh, not acknowledging guilt uh, not acknowledging certain emotions and how that can really prey upon you and you think of somebody like teddy roosevelt loses his father you know, at a very young age, loses his wife and his mother uh, on the same night. And there's a lot that might be, you know, unacknowledged there in terms of feelings. And when you're not introspective that way and you're pushing forward, it could have an effect, you know, long term on, on somebody. Talk to me a little bit about uh, how he handled that setback in February of 1884, losing his wife and his mother on the same night. Well, he was devastated initially. And typical of Roosevelt, he threw himself into some activity. And at that time, he, he was a, a member of the New York Assembly. And he threw him for several months of almost 24-7 political work in the state legislature of New York. Uh, but then he took off on an adventure. 
And this was typical throughout his life. When he had some kind of devastating loss, he would go off. And in this case, um, the, the loss within hours of each other of his mother of typhoid fever and his wife of kidney failure, just two days after mm -hmm. uh, the wife had given a birth to their daughter on February 12th, now February 14th, St. Valentine's Day, uh, he loses his wife and then his mother, throws himself into this frenzy of political activity for a while, but that didn't do it. And then he takes off to the West. They had fallen in love with the American West earlier. I mean, far earlier from reading as a child. Always had, had, had heroes, Daniel Boone, A.V. Crockett, and others were his heroes growing up. Um, but in 1883, he got out west to the Dakotas, to uh, Montana, on a hunting trip. Uh, and he fell in love with it. And it kind of tested his... <laughs> is metal out west there. Uh, in 1883, it was still the frontier. And he loved it so much, he bought a ranch, named it Maltese Cross, uh, in the valley of the Little Missouri in Dakota Territory. And so now, uh, after the devastating loss of his mother and his wife, only hours apart on the same day, he will head west and will spend the next several years in the West. Uh, later on, you can see other losses and similar activity. Um, after he, he ran on the third party as the Bull Moose Party in 1912 and lost, he took off on an exploration of the Amazon. And so this was his typical way of handling these losses. I don't know if he thought of it so consciously but it was an escape. It was an escape to a challenging adventure. And you also have to remember, when his father died, who was a man of wealth and position in New York, uh, Theodore Roosevelt had a substantial inheritance. And he could have lived the rest of his life something like what we call trust fund babies today, a life of indolence. Um, and in, instead, we know he graduated from Harvard, and then he went to Columbia Law School for a year. Uh, so he was a hard-charging, driven kind of character anyway. So I, I wouldn't want to try to so much psychoanalyze him as just describe his, his actions. And they were actions more typical of people of that era, that you tended just to um, suppress. That Victorian it, elk, to suppress a lot well, of those maybe emotions. maybe long before the Victorian era. Right. You know, going back centuries. This was something you had to endure, losses and suffering. It was just part of life. Mm. Um, and, and he did very well. You had to throw yourself into new activities, um, pull your own weight, and uh, no, nobody liked the whiner. <laughs> you know, that was America then. It was America from the very beginning. It was uh, it, it was rugged. We were pioneering people. So he heads out west, and let's not romanticize this setting here. He's eating biscuits and water. Horses are getting caught in the snow. He's riding hundreds of miles a day. What were some of these conditions that these ranchmen found themselves in out west? Yeah, it was rugged. I mean, the Badlands, the name sounds ominous enough. Uh, and, it, and it was just really rugged terrain. Uh, and the winters were brutal. And the summers could be hot. Uh, but there was good grass in the Valley of Lula, Missouri, which made it uh, ideal uh, for cattle ranching. Cattle ranching, this was on federal lands, on the public domain. But you could stake it out, and you could graze your cattle on these lands and make big bucks. Because eastern cities and upper Midwest cities were booming 
second half of the 19th century. They were industrializing, they were booming, and people needed to be fed. And beef from the West, what could be better? And the railroads got out there, making it convenient. I mean, you had the first Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. But now, in the late 1870s, the building of the Northern Pacific Railroad, 1880, uh, completed. And so now that goes right in through the Badlands. And now, conveniently, you could ship your cattle to eastern markets. Most cattle from there, of course, went to Chicago, Chicago stockyards, and then all the packing plants. Um, and, and that was the business you were in. But to live it out there on the ground was something else. This was still the frontier. I mean, when Roosevelt went on this hunting trip out there in 1883, only seven years before, in some 200 miles to the southwest, Custer and 200 men of the 7th Cavalry had been massacred in the Battle of Little Bighorn. So this is still the frontier era in the West. It's not all been civilized. You know, telegraph lines haven't been strung everywhere. The railroad doesn't reach this point or that point. It's still the Old West out there. And doctors, I mean, in this whole area that Roosevelt settled in, there was only one doctor. And he wasn't in the town most local to either of Roosevelt's ranches, but in the town of Dickinson, some uh, substantial distance away, one doctor in really? the entire territory. So most of the time, if you were terribly injured, and think about doing cowboy work out there, being thrown by a horse or kicked by a horse or whatever kind of injury you sustain, sustained, uh, there was no doctor in your local town. And so you had to do the best you could to have some of the other cowboys try to set that break and put you in a splint. I mean, you were on your own. One of the biggest disconnects for me, and I think with a lot of people today around Theodore Roosevelt, is uh, most pictures they see of him, he's standing over a dead rare animal. And the man obviously was a naturalist and is responsible for starting the conservation movement in the United States. Didn't he see the irony of you know killing so many animals, or uh, was it just the time and they didn't really think much of it? Well, not at all. There really wasn't any irony because uh, animals, the numbers of animals only were diminished by commercial hunting. They were never diminished by what uh, Roosevelt termed fair chase hunting, sportsman hunting, commercial hunting. That's decimated numbers of great game, game animals uh, like the buffalo. Commercial hunting, first by the Indians, which people don't understand or realize. They were the first commercial hunters in the buffalo. That's when their numbers began to decline. Uh, but then when the white hunters later got in it, that was just finishing off the last of the great herds that had already been diminished by commercial hunters for the Indians, uh, mainly then for the buffalo robes, uh, later on for the meat. Um, but that's the kind of hunting that mm. destroys uh, vast numbers of game animals. Uh, what Roosevelt saw was far more important than hunting, which is destruction of the habitat. And if the habitat was preserved, uh, numbers recover. Animals recover from season to season. The populations go up and down for a number of reasons. Diseases, blizzards in the winter, it's all sorts of causes but they would come back if the habitat's intact. And R Roosevelt saw that. And he saw the way where we, go we were going. Well, the land settled, the land's fenced, the land's carved up uh, by uh, railroads, by uh, dams, all these things, um, that we have to preserve millions of acres of land, the natural habitat for the big game animals. Uh, smaller game usually adapt much uh, more readily to the advance of civilization, but not the big uh, game animals. And and he, he went about that. He founded the Boone and Crockett Club 
you know, to begin and to talk about uh, the way uh, game animals should be hunted and the way the habitat should be protected. And he did more than anybody else uh, in protecting that. He was the conservation movement. Uh, I, I think he uh, put into national parks over 2 million acres of land and to protect its status. Uh, and I think about eight national parks all under Roosevelt. And he did that to preserve the habitat for the big game of the West. But also he was astounded by the beauty, the magnificence of the West. In a speech on July 4th in the Dakota Territory town of Dickinson, he gave an oration. He was invited to, and he did, you know. And afterwards, somebody said, you know, instead of a cattle rancher, I think you ought to be a politician. And someday, <laughs> you could be the president. And that was back in 1886. And they were right. But he gave a speech, and he said, America, it's, it's about big prairies and big rivers and big forests and big mountains and this. And that was the wonder of the Trans-Mississippi West. Everything was on this magnificent scale. And the beauty was astounding. And he wanted to see that preserved as well. He's in uh, the area of Mingusville when he has an encounter with somebody at a local Nolan's Hotel. What happens there? Well, it's one of the great stories about Theodore Roosevelt out west, because he came out there and they said, well, what is this? An Easterner is going to come out here and play Westerner, play cowboy. Harvard guy yeah, coming out there. Have it. You know, what, what, is, what is this? I mean, they all looked at it. And plus, he, he wore glasses. You know, mm -hmm. A young guy, some old guy pick up a reading glasses, that was okay. But here he wore glasses. I mean, this was just an embarrassment out there. And they all they looked at him and they said, what is this out here? Well, he surprised him because he threw himself into work on the ranch. And sometimes he'd be in the saddle for 12, 13, 14 hours a day. And the even the most seasoned cowboys were impressed. You know? He has grit. He has stamina. Um, he's willing to do the work that we all do. He throws himself into it with great vigor. Okay, but does he have sand? What will he do in a life or death situation? Now, see, this was really important to Westerners. They lived by the code of the West. And part of that code was to stand your ground. And uh, best summed up in the phrase, I'll die before I'll run. And <laughs> if anybody that wanted to live up to this code of the West and was being scrutinized, it was Theodore Roosevelt. Well, now it was late in the day and he'd been west of his Elkhorn Ranch looking for stray horses. And it's right up on the, uh, the border of Montana territory. And the sun was setting and he thought, well, I'll go over to Mingusville, small town, had a rail station though, had a hotel, Nolan's Hotel, had a livery. A uh, cluster of houses and small businesses. He said, "Now, nah, best I spend the night there." And he, he gets his horse boarded at the livery, and he's walking to Nolan's hotel. Bam, bam! These shots ring out. Oh, so he walks into the hotel, into the bar and dining room, and there's this cowboy with a six shooter in each hand, strutting about swearing and gas Canadian and and he, Roosevelt described the scene as everybody else in the, the bar and the restaurant had fake smiles on their face and like oh yeah this is all fun and we're enjoying it he said but you can see they really weren't and he looked up on the clock on the on the wall had two bullet holes right in the center of it evidence of this even though drunk this uh, cowboy's prowess with his six shooters. And so Roosevelt steps in there 
And a drunk looks at him and said, Oh, Four Eyes is going to treat the house to drinks. And Roosevelt kind of chuckled and sat down at a table, hoping that would be the end of it. And the uh, gunslinger comes over to the table and said, Four Eyes is going to treat the drinks. And Roosevelt knew, hey, it's time had come. Roosevelt stood up and hit the uh, gunslinger with a quick right cross, which I demonstrate, and left hook and another right, and down the gunslinger went. And as he went down, res reflexively, his guns fired, hitting no one. Bam, he went down, he was out. Roosevelt said for a second there, I thought he'd knee drop him in the ribs, but he saw he was unconscious. Well, that cemented <laughs> Roosevelt's reputation as a man who lived by the code of the West, a man who had sand. sand. Right. I mean, up until that time, they doubted this Easterner could really become a Westerner. So he earned his stripes in Mingusville and word spread after an event like that yeah, he certainly he certainly did. This was uh, this was uh, the kind of performance <laughs> that would have been expected of any man in the West, and Roosevelt lived up to it. And I know he boxed in college, so maybe some of those. Yeah, well, that that was why he threw that right cross, left hook, and followed by another right, bam, 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 a combination, and quickly uh, uh, dropped that gunslinger. Um, he, he was a, a top boxer on the uh, on the team at Harvard. He was also a top rower at Harvard. He, he was in, in physically uh, great shape. I mean, this idea of the sickly child. Well, the only thing that really been wrong with him when he was a child growing up, he had severe asthma attacks. And they tended to diminish as he got in his late teens. Um, and he, he became quite an athlete. I actually started boxing at a fairly young age when a couple older boys pummeled him fairly easily. And so then he was determined to learn to box and be able to defend himself. And he did. And uh, he was one of the top boxers on the Harvard boxing team. Theodore Roosevelt has another fascinating adventure that you write about in 1886. He purchases this boat to use on the Little Missouri River uh, almost looks like a rubber bathtub if you were to look at it today. And he would use this to cross the river, check up on the horses. One morning he walks out onto his piazza and he sees that the boat's gone and <laughs> that it had been cut loose with a knife. What state of mind was he in upon discovering this? Yeah, Roosevelt, the loss of his boat, it was stolen. And he thought, this is just outrageous. You know, steal, not theft. I mean, might hold up the uh, uh, payroll on the railroad or the treasure box from the stagecoach, but you don't steal from an individual like this. This is, well, he takes off after, the second boat takes off after the miscreants with a couple ranch hands. And it turns out these miscreants, the three in number, they were actually fleeing uh, vigilantes in Montana as they were trying to get away, and they saw this boat on the banks of the Little Missouri River. Bam, they got in it, floated downstream. Well, uh, they had a couple days head start on Roosevelt and his two ranch hands, but there were still ice flows on the Missouri River. It's just breaking up in the spring. And so that impeded uh, their progress, and also it was freezing. So they had to stop frequently to build fires, uh, hunt game for food. And this allowed, after a week of a chase, for Roosevelt to catch up with him. Spied a boat, his boat, <laughs> on the uh, bank of the Little Missouri River. And they got out and uh, climbed through some brush and they saw smoke from a fire. And one man was warming himself by the fire. And Roosevelt, with his Winchester, leaps out of the brush, levels his Winchester at him, and the man surrendered peacefully. And the two others were out hunting at the time. 
And so uh, they went back into the bush there and waited. And they came back in the camp singly, one by one. They came back in. And Roosevelt captured those two in the same manner. Leaps out with his rifle leveled. Uh, so he takes all three of them into his own custody. And now in two boats, they continue down the Little Missouri until they come to um, a ranch. And there they make contact with the rancher to borrow a wagon to take these three boat thieves uh, to the nearest town, which was 45 miles away, Dickinson. And Roosevelt thought, well, if we tie them up in this wagon, their uh, limbs will, will freeze. The circulation will be cut off, and they're, they're freeze. Uh, and he didn't want that to happen to him. You know, it shouldn't be a death sentence for, uh, for stealing the boat, but justice should be served. And so Roosevelt put them in the back of the wagon, and to guard them, he walked behind the wagon with Winchester in hand. And this was for 45 miles. And remember, it's freezing, and, and some of the ground's frozen, some of it's muddy. By the time he reaches Dickinson, his feet are terribly frostbitten and blistered. And so people, again, they thought this guy walked 45 miles through those conditions, um, a uh, certain physical effort that definitely impressed everyone. It's incredible. And he packs a camera with him on this uh, chase. And he documents, uh, you know, a photo of him, you know, posing in front of these three outlaws. Yeah, Roosevelt was very good <laughs> about documenting all his activities. Um, and it was not so much, people get the misimpression of kind of a self-aggrandizement. But it was more, he was such a kid in a way, so enthusiastic about all these things. He wanted to preserve it and record it. He was a huge fan of history. And he knew how important documentation was to history. And so he wanted to share this with everyone. I mean, that was, he's talked about being in a room with Roosevelt. I mean, he had this absolutely, uh, uh, ur an absolute urge to share all these things with everyone because he loved them so much, had such a passion for them, was so enthusiastic about them. And that was part of the reason he, he recorded these things and wrote about them and photographed them uh, to be able to share these experiences with other people. So, you know, through these incredible events, we see, you know, an extraordinary transformation occurs uh, over this period of TR's life, both physically and spiritually. How did this time really shape him into you know, who we know him as today? Well, he, he wrote, you can see this in his letters, back uh, to his uh, sister in, in New York, who during this time was taking care of his uh, baby daughter. Um, for almost three years, she, she raised uh, that daughter while Roosevelt was out west. But this... I think this mightily contributed to shaping the man we later know as Teddy Roosevelt. He became a rough and ready character, uh, ready to face any kind of challenge. I mean, think of this as the man who was shot in the chest making a speech while running for president and continued and finished his speech with a bullet in his chest. So this was now a rough and ready character. This was the character that had uh, so identified now with these uh, cowboys and teamsters and miners and explorers and gunfighters in the Old West that he organized them into the Rough Riders uh, for the, in, in, in the war of... Uh, 1898 there, he organized these guys. Now there were some Harvard Polo players and others, too, that joined the Rough Riders. But you can see his character. In a sense, we could say this was truly the American character. If 
Anybody who's a fan of the frontier, you have to remember the frontier began when the first settlers, with the first settlers on the Atlantic seaboard. And then it continued. Each generation moved west. Mm -hmm. So we had 250 years, a quarter of a millennium, of moving across the continent. And it was shaping the American character again and again, generation after generation after generation. And here Roosevelt, in his own way, although a scion of an aristocratic wealthy family in New York, he gets out there on the last generation with the frontier experience. And it, it really made him as American as you could be in the truest sense. He shared in this experience. He became rugged. He became ornery. Um, and you could see that in his presidency. But also, it didn't mean that you should be boastful and aggressive. It turns out, in the West, you should mind your P's and Q's. You should be rather tactful. Because if it came to a fight, that fight would probably be deadly. These were men <laughs> that, when they were thrown, that there was no jawing endlessly, as you see today in TV shows or movies. No, one or two way, one or two words, and that meant fight, and that could be fight to the death. And so that's you see Roosevelt then was actually rather tactful in his presidency, diplomatic. But he was ready to fight for the to the death. Right. We talked a little bit off camera about uh, how interesting it is. Before he's president, people really feared this guy, you know, because of that bellicose warlike image that he had. Um, people thought we're all going to be in trouble. This guy could be dangerous. People thought of him as a dangerous person. A lot of folks felt the same way when Ronald Reagan's running for the presidency as well. We can't have this guy's finger on the button. What, what is this going to look like exactly? Yet both statesmen, when they come into the office, they're diplomatic, as you touched on. They are uh, sparing in their use of force, and they're quite sophisticated about it, which really seems like a bit of a shocking surprise to a lot of people. Well, Roosevelt saw I really understood what the use of force meant. This wasn't anything theoretical to him. Uh, and after all, the losses they took going up uh, San Juan Hill, uh, th this was an incredible charge up there. He was the only one with a horse. He did half of it on a horse, and then this horse got stuck in barbed wire, uh, and then did the rest of it on foot. But here are all these men uh, charged these uh, Spanish uh, troops up there that had the latest rifles, the finest and latest rifles, smokeless powder. Uh, they were really well equipped. They were firing down on the Rough Riders coming up. Um, and the Rough Riders took a, a lot of wounded and killed. So Roosevelt, not only out west, but his, his later ex experience in the uh, Spanish-American War, all of this, he understood the consequences of um, military uh, conflict and action and the cost you paid in it. So, but at the same time, he wanted to let everybody know that America was the new kid on the block. Mm -hmm. I mean, he sent the great white fleet, as it was known, around the world. He wanted to let them know that if need be, we would fight. But he was not about to precipitate anything. So at the end of Roosevelt's time out west, there is a severe winter, I believe in 1887. What happens to a lot of these ranchmen, uh, the investment that he had made, of course, um, into so much cattle? Yeah, Roosevelt, in fact, all the ranchers uh, following the Civil War had done fabulously well on the open range of the American West um, because they were grazing their cattle on on federal land. I mean, some of them built up so many thousands of acres that they actually had title to. But for the most part, it was free grass. It was the nation's grass. Their cattle was eating it. So this was a great deal. 
Uh, and they went on for a good uh, 20 years until 1886 to 87. That winter turned out to be disastrous and destroy really the open range cattle industry at the American West. And it actually started during the summer of 1886. Up in uh, Dakota Territory, it was a blazing hot summer. And the normal uh, summer thunder showers didn't occur. And the grass turned brown and cattle uh, lost weight uh, and uh, some became uh, sick. And so they were nursing the cattle in poor condition. When winter came with uh, a, a vengeance in a blizzard in mid-November, it's an absolute horrific blizzard. Well, then it suddenly warmed up with a Chinook wind in December. And in one day, the temperature rose 50 degrees. So this meant the snow and the ice melted. Well, then this was followed by uh, Blue Northern coming down from Canada. And the temperature fell all of a sudden to 10 below, 20 below, 30 below, and a temperature of 41 degrees below zero was recorded. And so now all the melted snow turned into a huge sheet of ice. It's like the ice age had returned. And the cattle normally, through a, a thin sheet of ice and snow, they could paw down and find grass and other things to sustain themselves through the winter. Now they couldn't. They couldn't paw down through this thick ice sheet. And if ranchers couldn't bring them into a barn and feed them some hay that they had purchased from a farmer in the summer, well, they were sunk. And some of these ranchers uh, lost 80, 90 percent. Roosevelt lost 60 percent of his cattle, and he was one of the lucky ones. Loses so, half of his life fortune as well. And half of his uh, half of his fortune had, had gone up. If it hadn't been for that, he may have remained on that ranch for years more. Who knows how long he would have stayed there? He was happy. His letters uh, to his relatives back east uh, didn't say, "Well, I'm eager to get back." Um, no, he said, "This is the best I've ever felt." The happiest I've ever been is out here. He loved everything about uh, the life, not only as a rancher, but also as, as a hunter. Um, but that was it in 1887. Then by, uh, by the end of that summer, he was, uh, he was back east. He would return to the West for visits because he loved the people out there. He right. loved the men he met out there but he would never live there again as a cattle rancher. And this was generally an end to the open range cattle ranching that had characterized the West for two decades following the Civil War, that disastrous 1886 to 1887 winter. It's incredible to think you know, what that does to history if he stays out West and you don't have that winter and what it would look like. Yeah, I mean, he was indulging himself in a certain amount of political activity out West. So maybe that was satisfying that portion of his personality. He became president of the Stockmen's Association of Dakota Territory. And, there he, and for the three years he was there, he was president. Um, and, and people applauded his role. I mean, he was outstanding in that role, of course, with his great vigor and determination and everything else. And he ran it very well. He also became a member of the Montana Stockmen's Association. Um, and, and there he was uh, uh, not a president of it, but he was a member of one of their important committees. Um, so there he kind of indulged himself in that uh, appetite for politics in that sense. Now, would that have satisfied it for that long? Who knows? But he certainly would have spent uh, more than three years on his ranches out west. 
fast forward a little bit into uh, serving two terms as president, you could say that the office can tend to change somebody. You know, you get the sense that this is really true with Theodore Roosevelt. He gives up the office. It's one of the strangest things, very hard to understand. But in 1908, he can run again, but he doesn't. He pretty much hands, you know, in 1908, uh, the office over uh, to somebody secretly who he believes is not of his stature, not fit for the office, Taft. And he hands the office over their friends. And very quickly, you can see that it starts to eat away at him a little bit. Um, almost, you feel like it's somebody who, once he had the presidency, had a very difficult time not being president. Well, I think initially, he thought William Howard Taft would pretty much carry out the policies that uh, Roosevelt had set in place. Uh, and I, I think he was disappointed in um, in some ways, to some degree, with, with Taft on that. I mean, Taft uh, generally con con continued Roosevelt's programs, but not quite with the, the vigor and uh, determination that Roosevelt had. Didn't use the bully uh, the pulpit. The bully pulpit. pulpit. Right. As Roosevelt had. Um, and, and of course, uh, it meant generally that the party establishment took more control, where Roosevelt set the tenor and the tone for, uh, for the presidency, where Taft, it was more the party apparatus. I think that was one problem that, uh, that Roosevelt had. And, uh, of course, now watching somebody else do it and not in quite the manner that Roosevelt thought it should be done, I, I think caused him to get throw his hat back into the ring. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting to me is that when he wants the White House back and eventually decides to run against Taft, it is nasty. People love to talk about the rhetoric today and how it's sunk to a new low when um, you know, they forget we've been here before. And Teddy Roosevelt fighting Taft for the nomination and eventually creating his own party, it's brutal, isn't it? Well, of course. I mean, in and I seen battles are always the worst, you know, uh, brothers. <laughs> and, that's, and that's just what was going on. It was within the party. Uh, and so how could he ask somebody to be loyal here, loyal there? These factions uh, <clears throat> develop, but that's, that's as old as human beings are. And as far as the American presidency, somebody ought to go back and look at the uh, Adams presidency. And political opponents, he hadn't thrown in jail. Think about that in America. I mean, my God, this is... And only a few years after the adoption of the, the Bill of Rights. I mean, how could that be? Well, it was done. I, I mean, they had the Sedition Act and they had all this. And a press, the press, the freedom of the press. Well, Adams was having people thrown in jail for things that was printed in their newspaper. So new lows. I mean, think about what they said about Thomas Jefferson. And it was it was all fabricated. And yeah, some people they still believe some of these things, but it was fabricated. Um, so horrific charges. And think about the mud they was slung at Andrew Jackson. I mean, you can go back a number of times in in our history. And so these battles are nothing new. But the battles, when you have two people of the same party, well, that's what happened with, with Roosevelt. It became particularly, particularly vicious. And Roosevelt, of course, was not one who would back down. The disconnect, I think, today is we tend to elevate these people. We put them you know, on Mount Rushmore. We build monuments to them. A good politician has got to be a political animal. He has to be vicious. And you think back, you know, you look at the Federalists with uh, Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton, pretty nasty stuff. You read some of those broadsides, you know, from the 1790s, uh, post-Civil War era, um, you, know, you tend to, to think, you know, we've been here before 
as you had, had touched on, and this is nothing new for, for American politics. No, I mean, we forget human beings are human beings. And, I, and that's why uh, I have a difficult time with people today tearing down some monument to, to this uh, uh, one-time American hero or another. I mean, people are highly flawed. We're human beings. We have good things. We have bad things. We, but you look for what somebody accomplished in their era, in the context of their time, and to superimpose uh, standards today that may be discarded in another decade or two. But whatever is current and hip and fashionable today, to judge somebody by those standards historically, and also not to acknowledge uh, that, that everybody's flawed. And you go back to the, the, the plays of Sophocles or, or somebody in, in, in Greece, and you look at these great uh, tragic characters. I mean, everybody had, had flaws. You'd like to think they're noble flaws, um, but that's part of being a human being. And it seems so um, uh, ignorant and, and uh, almost childish to uh, judge people by, by some standard, not only standard today, but some standard of perfection. And if somehow you fall short of that, you're to, to be discarded. Had Teddy Roosevelt lived and run in 1920, a lot of people believe that he would have walked away, he would have easily won. You know, do you believe that? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of being a prophet. But uh, it was still a highly uh, popular character. And so much so, he was still such a force that he wanted to volunteer uh, to organize a regiment to fight in World War I. And Woodrow Wilson would have none of that because he, he saw what a powerful force that Roosevelt still was at that time. And he thought, oh, that's all I need. Here he will become a, uh, a war hero again, this time in World War I. Um, and so that, that's certainly, uh, maybe not a probability, but certainly a strong possibility. Um, but I don't think it's far-fetched to, to argue that because he still was a highly popular figure in, in, in America, so much so that Woodrow Wilson didn't want him to have any part of World War I. You, know? you can't even begin to calculate some of the things that would happen if Teddy Roosevelt wins in 1920 as opposed to Warren Harding, who is a big disappointment. Um, you know, towards the later years of TR's life, you kind of get this sense of melancholy. He's trying to find his place. He wants to run again. And the saddest part, I feel, is he loses his son in World War I. Uh, and I imagine there must have been an incredible amount of guilt there. It's not something that people went to therapists or, or psychiatrists. Um, There's no such thing as being introspective that way. But he loses his son in a war that he championed. And he very much wanted to fight in that war, as you touched on, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but wasn't allowed to. He encourages all of his sons to go off, and Quentin's uh, killed. He was a pilot. Was there guilt there, do you think? Well, I'm, I'm sure he, he thought about it. He was heartbroken over that. But on the other hand, that's what a man was supposed to do. You were supposed to serve your country and do your duty. Um, and I, I suspect... That's how Roosevelt thought about it. I mean, maybe he thought at times, I encouraged all this. I encouraged him to do that. But on the other hand, that was being virtuous. That was being patriotic. That was doing your duty. And there's a cost in, in that. And if there were not, then it wouldn't be so highly regarded. So I suspect that's how Roosevelt probably looked at it. But still, he was absolutely heartbroken over that. My last one, uh, Roosevelt is a Republican. He's one of the most famous of the Republicans. Uh, but you look at the Republican Party today and, and you look at Teddy Roosevelt, you see that he's a, a trust buster. 
He's almost fanatically interested in reigning in business. You know, how does that fit with the Republican Party today? Well, right now, I think it fits more with the Republican Party, but that's why there was there's a big faction. Republican establishment today uh, is more of that old donor class and more of the big business uh, friendly, where Trump was not that at all. Trump was more of a populist. Trump was more of a, a Teddy Roosevelt, a trust buster. I mean, I, I think Teddy Roosevelt and Trump both saw the problems with a certain degree kind of monopolistic capitalism and the kind of power could, that uh, back then industrialists could exercise today, uh, back then, today more uh, the high tech mm -hmm. Silicon Valley exercising this power over our communication uh, systems. So there's a lot of, a lot of similarities uh, today. And Roosevelt took on the Republican establishment back then. And Trump took on the Republican establishment today. So there, there's certain certain degree of uh, analogy between their, their, their presidency, wildly popular with uh, their constituency, kind of grassroots America, wildly popular, both of them, but not so popular with the established power brokers. I mean, back then, Mark Hanna had Roosevelt put into the vice presidency, thinking he would simply disappear. Uh, I mean, think of the man who had been vice president, Garrett Hobart. Can anybody name him? I mean, think of, how about the vice president during the Civil War? Can anybody name him? You cannot. You can name the vice president the last couple of months of the Civil War. Johnson, right. Yeah, Andrew Johnson. Can you name the vice president all through the Civil War, though? Hannibal Hamlin? Uh, you put that on any test. Nobody in America could name that. I mean, almost <laughs> nobody could name that. And that's why they put Theodore Roosevelt into the vice presidency. All the Republican bosses, ha, you disappear. You disappear there. Well, as we know, McKinley was assassinated. And Mark Hanna, the boss, said, oh, damn, that damn cowboy is now president. Well, I think I've exhausted most of my questions. I hope I haven't wasted your time. This was fantastic. Uh, it was actually my dream job to sit down and, and talk to, to people like you. And I've absolutely loved your writing. Uh, what are you working on now? Well, I'm doing a radio series on uh, various American historical figures. Um, and most recently, I'm, I'm doing American actors who were the biggest stars prior to World War II that much to the uh, chagrin of the studio bosses uh, quit Hollywood and volunteered for service in World War II. It's a very important distinction there. They were the biggest stars in Hollywood that left that behind. And went to go and, fight. And went, went to fight. Clark Gable, Tyrone Power, Jimmy Stewart, Wayne Morris. I mean, these guys. Top of the game. Top of the game. Top of the mm -hmm. game. Cannot thank you enough for doing this. Sure, this is you. an incredible pleasure. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's it for Hindsight History. My thanks to Roger McGrath for this absolute treat. We'll see you next time.